You live in an age like no other. You live in an age where there is a great falling away. You live in an age that calls good evil and evil good. You live in an age where men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You live in an age where godly boundaries have been removed by the very fabric of society. You live in an age where the love of many has waxed cold. You live in an age where men and women worship mammon. You live in an age where mankind worships at the altar of Baal, Ashtoreth, and Molech. You live in an age where mankind is being prepared to worship the Antichrist and accept his mark. You live in an age where men and women are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You live in an age where mankind worships at the altar of self, self-love, self-adoration, self-exaltation. You live in an age where unclean spirits dwell. You live in an age where principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places dwell. You live in an age where seducing spirits dwell. You live in an age where demons and the devil are present. You live in an age where Bible prophecy is unfolding before your eyes. You live in an age of deception, an age where the foundations of truth are constantly under attack. You live in an age where the very institutions that should be pillars of light are often infiltrated by shadows. Church, my dear brethren, is not exempt from this infiltration. We are witnessing a time where, within the sacred walls of our sanctuaries, there is a sinister presence that lurks. There are demons in some churches. It's not about the theatrical demon possessions we see in movies. It is not about people levitating or strange apparitions. But it is something far more subtle and far more dangerous. It's the demons of false doctrines, of distorted truths, of misleading teachings that are of a demonic origin. Did you ever sit in a pew or listen to a sermon online? and feel that something isn't right, that what you're hearing just doesn't align with the scriptures. That's because there's a battle, a spiritual warfare, raging within the very walls of the church. It's an insidious war, where the enemy doesn't come with pitchforks, but with smooth words and charismatic teachings, leading many astray. Now, I want to take you to a passage in the Bible, 1 Timothy 4, 1, where it warns us, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What we are experiencing, what many of us are witnessing, is precisely this. There are many people who are heading in the direction of hell, and they have no idea whatsoever that they are on this path. They wholeheartedly believe they are destined for heaven, yet tragically they are mistaken they consider themselves children of God, but this belief is misplaced. The reason for this grave misconception is that they are heeding the teachings of demons rather than the Word of God. Scripture speaks clearly about the reality of hell and the criteria for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, 21, 23 gives a sobering warning from Jesus himself, who says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This passage reveals that verbal profession alone is insufficient without obedience to God's will. This is what you need to know before this year ends. God cares how you live your life. God cares whether you sin or do not sin. God cares whether you pray or do not pray. God cares. As a child of God, you are not allowed to live any way you please. The world attempts to paint a picture of a God who invites everyone to come as they are and stay as they are. Live whatever way you want. Behave whatever way you want. Talk and speak whatever way you want. Live whatever kind of lifestyle you want. Marry whoever you want. But that is not correct. The God of this Bible has given us a way. We, as His children, should live our lives. The God of this Bible is a God that likes to get up all in His children's business. Every aspect of your life, God has a way He wants you to conduct yourself. 
In this Bible you will find instructions about how you should live as a single person. In this Bible you will find instructions on how God wants you to behave in your marriage. In this Bible, you will find instructions on how God wants you to handle your money, your parenting, and much more. A child of God needs to behave in a particular way, and I am not saying for one second that a child of God never sins. David sinned, Abraham sinned, Moses sinned, and all these men were still great men of God, because they repented when they sinned. Even when we sin, we are expected to behave in a particular way, and repent for our sins, and ask for forgiveness. This is one of the key differences between the saved and the unsaved. The unsaved, when they sin, they carry on with their life. But when the saved sin, they ask for forgiveness, like David did in Psalm 51, Matthew 10, 32, 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Spurgeon states, What Christ is to you on earth, that you will be to Christ in heaven. I shall repeat that truth. Whatever Jesus Christ is to you on earth, you will be to him in the day of judgment. If he be dear and precious to you, you will be precious and dear to him. If you thought everything of him, he will think everything of you. The Statement by Spurgeon Whatever Jesus Christ is to you on earth, you will be to him in the day of judgment, is a powerful truth that we should all take to heart. It reminds us of the close relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior, and of the importance of our response to him in this life. So what is Christ to you on earth? Is he a distant figure, someone you only think of on Sundays or in times of need? Or is he your everything? the center of your life and the source of your hope and joy? Is he a genie in a bottle that you only pray to when you are in trouble? Or is he your very heartbeat, the very air you breathe? Is he your last resort or is he your first resort? If Christ is dear and precious to you, then you can take comfort in the fact that you will be precious and dear to him on the day of judgment. Your love for him will not go unnoticed and he will reward you for your faithful devotion. However, if Christ is not a central part of your life, if he is just a casual acquaintance or a passing thought, then you should be concerned. We must understand that our response to Christ in this life will determine our relationship with him in eternity. If we are faithful to him now, if we love him and serve him with all our heart, then we will be rewarded with a close and intimate relationship with him in heaven. But if we ignore him or reject him in this life, then we will be separated from him forever. We will not experience the joy and peace that comes from knowing Him, and we will miss out on the eternal life that He offers. Do you know where the exact location of hell is? The exact location of hell is at the end of a Christ-rejecting life. No one enters heaven and rejects Christ. He is the one and only way to eternal life. He is the one and only way to the Father. You have to do business with Him. You can't avoid Him. You can't bypass Him. And you can't deny Him and receive eternal life. Matthew 10.33 But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. This is not to say one denial means you are doomed to hell that is incorrect. We see that Peter denied the Lord three times and was forgiven and restored. So if you have denied Christ, God will forgive you and restore you. A person can profess Christ with their mouth, and deny Christ with their life. To confess Christ means much more than a statement with your lips. It means that that statement made with your lips is backed up by a life that professes Christ. The Bible is clear you cannot say you love Christ and disobey Him. This hard truth in the Bible, hard truth that people don't like to preach, obedience to Christ's commandments is both a sign and a test of our love for Him. John 14:15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. This simple yet profound statement reminds us that our love for God is not just about our feelings or emotions, but it is also about our actions. Jesus did not say, if you love me, feel like it. He did not say that. If you love me, your emotions will tell you. He did not say that. If you love me, you will feel a soft, goey, mushy feeling in your heart. No, 
Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. So how can we prove our love for God? The answer is clear, by keeping his commandments. God has given us his commandments in his word, and it is our responsibility as Christians who love him to follow them. Now, I know that some of you may be thinking, but pastor, keeping God's commandments is not always easy. We all make mistakes, and sometimes we fall short of God's standards. And you are right. We are all imperfect, and we all fall short of God's glory. But that does not mean we should give up on striving to keep His commandments. Instead, we should ask God for help and guidance in keeping His commandments. We should pray for the Holy Spirit to empower us to live a life that is pleasing to God. And we should also surround ourselves with other believers who can support and encourage us in our walk with Christ. Moreover, we should not view keeping God's commandments as a burden or a chore. Rather, we should see it as an opportunity to demonstrate our love for God and to grow closer to Him. And the fact is, keeping God's commands will keep you out of the trouble of sin. Nothing will destroy a life like the trouble of sin. The graveyards are full of people who got into it because of the trouble of sin. Prisons are full of people because they got into the trouble of sin. In addition, we should also remember that keeping God's commandments is not just about following rules or checking off a list of do's and don'ts. It is about living a life that reflects the character of God and the love of Christ. Love those around you. Help those who are less fortunate. Live a life of honor and integrity. When we keep His commandments, we are demonstrating to the world that we are His disciples and we are bearing witness to His truth and His salvation. Your life is a testimony. I want us to imagine a glorious moment that we all long for, the day when we get to heaven and hear Jesus say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. I sometimes lay in bed at night and imagine this wonderful day. This is the moment when we will finally meet our Lord and Savior face to face and receive our reward for our faithfulness to Him. Can you imagine the joy and excitement that will fill our hearts as we stand before Jesus? We will finally see the one who loved us and gave his life for us. We will finally be in the presence of the one who saved us from our sins and gave us eternal life. And then, Jesus will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. These words will be the most precious and meaningful words we will ever hear. Live each day with this goal in mind to hear those words from our Lord.